okay welcome to this presentation I'm going to talk about cookies web crawlers and search engines and the relation between them so first I'm going to provide a background of all these three and then talk about the relation among them what is a cookie a cookie is a simple text file that is stored on your computer whenever your client browser will request a web page so um, let's see what do cookies look like as I said it's a text file stored on your client browser and the text file contain name and value pairs so I have something like name is equals to cookie A or cookie 1 and I have a lot of name value pairs in it that give some information I have the path that can be suppose like google.com slash search that is my path for which the cookie is valid and in this example my domain is google.com so th these three things are stored in a text file on my machine or that is a client browser so how does cook how are cookies transmitted and received I'm talking about storing them on the client machine so how are they created this diagram illustrates the same the first is the browser will request a web page now you open up your browser and um, type a domain name like google.com so when you're a new client and you do not have any existing cookies the web server will send you back the page that is the google.com search page along with a cookie or a lot of cookies depends on the implementation so you have a cookie you have the web page now whenever you send another request to the same domain that is google.com your browser will actually send back the cookie along with the request now this because of this the web server that is google.com knows that you are a previous client or an old client and uh, it can use the cookie to present information to you that is relevant uh, I'll discuss the usages of cookies in the following slides so it will be more clear for now it is um, enough to understand how request and reply facilitate in uh, transfer of cookies so by these three steps uh, this trans transfer happens moving forward we have uh, types of cookies now this is not a single type of cookie but they have they are in general text files but there are many types of cookies so I'll go through all these six types the first one is the session so session cookies as the name indicates are valid for one session that is a session is you open up your browser start browsing when you are done with the browsing you close the browser so this time between the start of of the browser and the closing of the browser is one session the cookies valid for this session are known as session cookies as the browser stored in memory these cookies are also stored in memory so when the browser is closed that is moved out of memory the cookies are also deleted so hence the name session okay uh, the next one is persistent persistent cookies are valid for a lot of uh, more than one browser session so that is why they are stored on the hard drive for example suppose I am logged into gmail okay and I keep save my username and password and I want to remain logged in so what I do what uh, Google will do will send me back some cookies they'll be sent back to my client browser to my browser sorry and then the browser will store them store them to my hard drive suppose I'll um, uh, close the browser okay then after some time I open up my browser again navigate to Gmail and my mail will open it won't ask me for my username and password again this is because I have cookies already present and because the my browser actually requesting the page uh, the second time so it is sending back the cookies so Google reco Gmail recognizes that I'm uh, an old client and instantaneously will respond with my um, Google account and that is my mail account instead of asking me for my username and password again so th that is the use of persistent cookies so they're valid for more than one session and quite useful 
okay third is secure now secure cookies are only useful when you ha you're transferring data via the HTTPS protocol that is HTTP secure this is particularly useful in bank transactions and transactions that are transmitting or sending receiving private information that you do not want anyone else to uh, look upon or you don't want that information to be exposed to anyone so you'll be using encrypted in, uh, connections and hence you'll use secure cookies the cookies themselves will be encrypted so um, that's why they name the secure cookies the next one is HTTP only now these cookies can be used only via the HTTP protocol and they cannot be accessed via non HTTP application programming interfaces that is APIs now for example suppose I have cookie okay that is HTTP only I cannot write a script suppose a JavaScript that will access that HTTP cookie because JS is non HTTP API so that is how it is HTTP only cookies are much more secure than other HTTP cookies I'll come to the use of secure and HTTP only in cookies in the following slides but for now you, you have to know the definition to be familiar with them okay so secure is HTTPS compliant HTTP only can only be accessed via the HTTP protocol simple okay moving forward you have third-party cookies now these are the most typical example is ads you have a lot of advertisements going on on web pages so uh, whenever you're browsing let's say uh, a forum or any website that has browse that has advertisements built in so the first party cookie will be that of your forum or the uh, website that you're browsing and the third party cookies will be the cookies sent by the ad server to your system that is done by default for the ad servers and they are not very useful for the client because they'll actually track your uh, browsing history as you move from website to website and sometimes uh, you can say that they're useful because they'll display relevant ads depending upon your browsing history but mostly they are just tracking you and uh, exposing your privacy so they're potential violators of user privacy those are third party cookies right moving on to super or zombie cookies as I said as I have written here it's m they're most dangerous uh, the simple reason being they can be recreated what I mean by recreated is you can actually recreate those cookies via information saved in the local cache that cache may be a local storage for HTML5 uh, for flash local storage and etc so um, they are potentially banned these days because of the privacy violations they bring along with them uh, so these are the type of cookies that exist we move forward so why are they used why are cookies used well there are plenty of reasons first one is session management now uh, for example you're doing online shopping and uh, you buy a bunch of stuff so this web server has to keep track of the items in your cart it does so by the use of cookies it will whenever the client browser will send back the cookies it will update your cart and keep a record of the items in your cart on the web server so it has a way of identifying you and your things that you are selecting for to be to be purchased so that is session management okay that's one use the another is personalization what I mean by personalization is um, suppose you log into Gmail or Google and set up a background for your search engine set up different preferences for mail etc those preferences are actually saved on the web server but when you're logging in your the web server will send back the cookies containing those preferences now whenever you send back those cookies when you make requests the web server exactly knows what to send you back 
like it will send you the likes and it won't send you what you don't like depending upon the preferences that you have already set before so this uh, selection of preferences is actually done via cookies they are used to filter users depending upon their preferences uh, for example you can set up an iGoogle page uh, load some application in there and the settings of that iGoogle page are actually sent uh, transmitted to and fro via cookies that is how you get the page uh, that you set before and not some other guy's page so um, that is along with authentication also so cookies work along with authentication and that is what I mean by personalization like your own stuff your own personal stuff okay the third one is tracking as I mentioned before uh, this slide third party cookies tracking is tracking movements within the website or um, logging user activity like he's moving from one website to another that can be done via third party cookies as I mentioned before within one website that can be done via the first party cookie itself that is the cookies of the website that you are visiting right now that is the first party cookies so these are three uh, main uses of cookies right uh, moving forward cookie attributes as I said before you have name value pairs in a cookie so I have a name say lsid let me see uh, i have a pointer let's say i can show you with a pen so uh, this is a name and this is a value so name is equals to value so in this case this set cookie instruction is actually asking my browser to set a cookie in which one attribute is named lsid whose value is dq triple k up to up to something ending with a G okay its domain is docs.foo.com so I may have visited this website and it is asking my browser to save this cookie so this is my domain name right and the path is slash accounts so the website that I have visited is docs.foo.com slash accounts okay and I'll talk about expires in a um, just a few moments it's a one of the attributes and this cookie is secure signifying that this is used via HTTPS and the same follows for this where something like HSID is sent set to something depending on the server path slash that is the root path so I'm visiting foo.com simply uh, I'm sorry it's dot foo.com so it must be some subdomain of foo.com and it's HTTP only so this cookie um, cannot be accessed via JavaScript okay uh, coming to expires and max age now this is for uh, this is used by the client browser to delete cookies whenever this time uh, is reached the cookie is automatically deleted so this cookie will be deleted on Tuesday 15 Jan 2013 at this time GMT. Now uh, the same thing can be done via by setting max age. This is this value is in seconds, so this instructs my browser to delete this cookie um, after 300 seconds. So these two control the amount of time a cookie stays on the client machine. So I have domain and path and expires and max age okay the next values that I have previously talked about is secure and HTTP only now they don't have associated attributes uh, I mean the values you must have seen here there is nothing like secure is equals to something Let me show you it's not like secure is equals to some value it's not like this it's just secure only this this keyword is enough to signify that it's a secure cookie similarly you don't have anything equal to something it's just HTTP only so <coughs> this keyword is enough to specify the cookie attribute that's what I mean by they don't have associated values okay uh, as I said before secure attribute is meant to keep cookie communication limited to encrypted transmissions that is secure communications 
and uh, HTTP attribute directs browsers to use cookies via the HTTP protocol only um, also mentioned before okay this is um, quite interesting this is known as breadcrumb web navigation now in this uh, I was browsing a online shopping store looking for web looking for books and uh, I searched for artificial intelligence book first then I searched for distributed systems then I searched for Linux device drivers now as I was searching for another book I just scrolled down and found this recommendation based on browsing history and then I noticed the books that I had searched in this order so the web server that is the online shopping server was actually keeping track of uh, the books that uh, I had searched before and it was displaying some recommendation also like recommended products it's actually recommending me Linux kernel based upon this Linux device drivers so this is actually pretty useful when uh, you're actually targeting potential customers and this is accomplished by cookies your cookies are sent back from the browser you're actually tracking which pages are being sent back and uh, you're keeping a log of them and then displaying relevant results this is a nice use of cookies now there are some limitations also uh, a cookie size as mentioned in the first slide is limited to 4 kilobytes so one cookie text file maximum 4 kilobytes uh, for a single browser it can only store up to 300 cookies um, and for a given domain let's say google.com can only set 20 cookies per client that is per machine uh, for what I think this is basically to reduce third-party cookies ultimately uh, to prevent the user privacy being exposed so uh, from what I've seen first-party cookies are at the maximum 4, 5 or 10 at the max so 20 cookies or more than 20 cookies allowing more than that number will actually give advertisers an opportunity to send as many cookies as they want and thereby violating keeping uh, a lot of records about the user which we do not actually want so um, this limitation actually prevents such a uh, tracking okay uh, about the disadvantages now cookies as I said text files plain text so except the secure cookies everything is in plain text now in case of uh, I'll explain this one second in case of uh, server and a browser interacting sending cookies and receiving cookies an attacker may actually use a sniffer program here and uh, sniff out the text of the cookie create a cookie file here and act with the interact with the server using this cookie file now the attacker will get the same preferences the same information that is liked by this client browser so you're actually impersonating this browser and getting his preferences on this machine attacker's machine so this is network eavesdropping uh, pretty simple technique uh, but uh, only valid for cookies that are in plain text second is XSS now this is cross-site scripting what we're actually doing is I'll demonstrate a script here Okay. Mm, let's say suppose I'm visiting a forum let's say forums.com okay and forums.com has message posted in which it says click here right I don't know where the link is going to point ultimately but looking at the source code of the HTML I see that it's pointing to this attacker.com some CGI script and a function that is a JavaScript function which actually is getting my document dot cookie so this guy is actually on clicking this text click here will actually send my cookies of the current web page to this website now this is very dangerous because you're actually sending your cookies okay and by sending your cookies is actually giving your personal preferences to someone else for their use so um, this is prevented by HTTP only cookies because this document.cookie 
won't work with the HTTP only cookies because it's non HTTP API compliant so this won't work with HTTP only cookies and hence that is why they are there they are useful they prevent such XSS attacks so uh, this is XSS so uh, this diagram actually illustrates the server and the browser are actually interacting the attacker uh, the browser actually this is a forum in this case F bad drawing but I hope it's F so this is a forum and browser is browsing this forum it clicks on the text that is click here and it sends its cookies to the attacker pretty simple neat trick for the attacker to get a lot of cookies innocent people will send their cookies attacker will use them for this zone good okay clear this out another thing is cross-site request forgery now this is different from XSS in the way that this is also sent uh, oh sorry this is also posted on a web forum okay like let's say a forum or a web page that you're browsing but it actually asks it actually instructs your browser to do something based upon the cookies you already have so suppose I'm on a forum okay forum.com I have posted an attacker has posted a this message okay you're actually seeing an image but clicking on that image will actually trigger this bank.example.com it will withdraw some money out of account user for the attacker and this is the amount you can see <laughs> the amount so your browser suppose has the cookie for bank.example.com you are logged into your bank okay and by mistake you click on this link so this will actually trigger this much withdrawal for attacker from your account without your permission because you already have those cookies you're valid to make transactions so this is access this is cross-site request forgery uh, pretty dangerous and these can be contrived and maybe present anywhere so you have to be very very careful while you're browsing the internet so network eaves doping xss and cross-site request forgery um, disadvantages okay so um, i have web bots now web bots are simply crawlers that will mm, browse the world wide web in an automated methodical fashion as depicted in the diagram there is bots moving around the world wide web general working will uh, initially they start off with a list of urls that is a list of links that they are will actually go and visit so they are called seats now these links are called seats the bots will visit these websites in seeds and fetch content now within those seeds it will identify the links to other websites and add it to its frontier that is the list of websites that it has to visit okay so this list will keep on growing as it, the links are added to the list and the crawler will keep on visiting those links in order this is how a general web uh, bot works okay so it will start with the list go on following links in that links in those links and adding the new links in uh, in his list so this is the general working uh, this diagram shows a high level architecture of a standard bot so uh, let me explain this step by step suppose uh, this is your this is a web search okay just s say as google.com for example i'm not favoring any search engine but this is just for explanatory purposes it has a multi-threaded download now what i mean by this is it's running parallel threads okay and they are um, visiting websites so you have this running on the web server of the search engine you have a scheduler okay so it has mm, the uh, crawl frontier that is the list of websites that the uh, downloader has to visit and fetch contents from that is why you have an input from the scheduler to the downloader as URLs so it will send the link this will visit the web pages 
and store the text fetch from it from to, to its internal storage somewhere in this search engine okay and whenever it gets new links I mark this as n so whenever it get new links on the current web page that it does not have in its list of URLs it will add it to its queue okay in this direction to the queue and this queue is again used by scheduler to visit the links again so it forms a cycle like this and uh, this keeps on going this is an ongoing process uh, by which the search engine will keep updated copies of web pages and of course the input to the downloader is the world wide web I mean this is from where it fetches content pretty simple example pretty high level architecture of a web bot okay so these bots are identified by their names so google.com is identified by google bot whenever you see google bot in your traffic list an administrator will know that google bot or the google web crawler actually visited his website so they are identified by the user agent field so this is the thing which identifies in an http request the type of bot i mean the bot which is actually visiting your website so you have yahoo's bot names as yahoo slurp and bing's as bing's bot bing bot okay so the, na the naming is helps administrators to identify bots that's the only purpose okay because they're not users they're just automated systems visiting websites now this is the most important part of web bots is their policies uh, quite essential to describe them um, in a neat manner so that yeah, you understand it properly selection policy <coughs> okay this defines which pages the crawler has to visit and download information from so th this comes under selection policy in the diagram it's it appears here uh, selection policy will appear here okay scheduler will actually select the pages which ha it has to visit I mean the downloader has to visit okay so it will be decided by uh, by the selection scheduler the revisit policy will help decide when to check uh, the list of pages when to recheck them for changes so web pages are dynamic they change new information is posted previous information may be deleted so this policy will actually define when to revisit pages uh, also in the diagram it will come here also in the scheduler part because the scheduler will only decide when to revisit a page and when to visit a new page okay so I'm writing with that R that is revisit as is for selection okay politeness policy now this is uh, quite important how does a web uh, crawler avoid overloading websites since they are not legitimate user requests they are just requests to fetch information so they should uh, take care of websites that they visit not to uh, take uh, hamper the bandwidth and hamper the service that has been provided to legitimate I mean real human users so they have to be very careful in their politeness policies these web bots um, I'll describe in the next slide how useful this is another thing is parallelization policy uh, this is about coordination upon among crawler processes so it's like in the diagram it's come it comes across in this position like you have a multi-threaded downloader here this is where your parallelization policy comes you have a multiple threaded uh, threads running this thread may be visiting the first hundred websites this thing this thread may be visiting the next hundred they have to coordinate among each other so that they don't visit revisit a website again so this is about the policy parallelization is all about it talks about the different threads and the, the making sure that you don't visit redundantly websites okay redundant websites <coughs> okay these are four web crawler policies 
there are two terms related to these policies is average freshness and average age now average freshness is um, the number of outdated pages and about average age is concerned with how old the pages are now these there's a fine line differentiating these two terms so let me explain it you know separately uh, by this diagram again I have a scheduler which is going to have a list of websites that it has to visit that is fresh from the queue now average freshness is suppose I'm visiting initially I have visited a hundred pages okay within those hundred pages I found 50 new links I have added those 50 new links to my queue now when I'm visiting those 50 new links I found another hundred links then I add them to my queue so I have 100 plus 50 plus 100 so about 250 links now when I'm when I continue this process I have a thousand a hundred thousand links the initial hundred links or initial thousand links are quite old now they may have changed they may have updated information so that is what I mean by freshness that is the number of outdated pages so then they may have been updated and I don't have the new information with me so that is signified by average freshness about average age is how old the pages are you may have visited them yesterday you may have visited them uh, a month ago so this this decision has to be taken by this bot when to visit the old website again the role of scheduler in this so these two terms are pretty important in design of a web bot okay so if you want to keep freshness high then you need to visit the pages again and again but keep in mind that you are not being polite you are overloading websites you may be visiting them too frequently so this is what I meant uh, this is what I meant when I said I'll discuss them later because politeness is actually dependent on uh, the content you have you may have a, very, a fresh content but you may be overloading websites you may be disrupting network service but you have fresh content so which is bad for the website but it's good for you uh, on the other hand if you have old outdated web pages and you're not overloading website you're polite you have outdated information but um, the website is running fine so you have to web bots have to strike a balance so that they are polite as well as they have uh, somewhat high freshness of, of their web pages and age has to be minimized the average age should be kept as low as possible so adjusting these two with these policies all four of them you get a good design of a web bot okay right so another thing is called spider trap now uh, suppose I have this uh, URL take a pen here right this is foo.com this is a made up URL <laughs> so it's foo.com slash bar slash foo slash bar slash foo slash bar and goes on now whenever a crawler or web bot tries to visit this foo.com and suppose I have a link from foo.com to foo.com slash bar so I have a link which is pointing from this to this mm -hmm. okay we'll clean this out first so I have a link from this to this okay so when I visit this I find that this link this entire link is new I add it to my queue then I visit this link and I find that I have a link to this one okay and that is new I add it to my queue again and let's say this has a link to this and I add it to this entire thing to my queue again and one of them one of them may add will go back and point to this again like foo.com so between these uh, the amount of cycles that I make actually disrupt the functioning of my web uh, bot because the web bot will be um, running in circles in the same website and ultimately not getting spending its time efficiently it may be wasting web resources as well as its time itself because these links are circular they point to the same website it has already visited them before so it has to avoid such kind of cycles within a web page such kind of links that form cycle within a web page so this is actually avoided by your politeness because you're actually 
um, avoiding overloading by um, let's say uh, delaying web page requests so you may visit foo.com then you may wait for some time and then go to foo.com slash bar now you can check whether you have already navigated to foo.com before and then do not navigate it once you have it already in your list so combining those four policies you can actually avoid these such kind of traps okay so this this kind of crafty URL is called as a spider trap and may overload web servers and obviously it can cause itself to crash because if it is not designed properly so spider trap okay let me demonstrate something like uh, robots.txt in sitemap for a bit more information okay so um, this is about how um, okay uh, I'm t talking about sitemap here let's say this is my website okay and I have a file called sitemap.xml now this file contains the list of web pages that I have in my website and they change frequencies suppose mm, I have uh, tutorials which is a page in my website and its change frequency is daily now a web bot may actually visit my website and look for this file it will look for this file read all these frequencies based upon their pages and then visit these pages according to this frequency law now this means every day it will visit my tutorials page and update its database okay so this is actually to coordinate my website update frequency with the web bots policies quite useful if you do not want your website to be overloaded and at the same time want current uh, information to be displayed when someone uses the search engine using the same bot who is using the bot to collect information okay so this is one thing sitemap.xml put it it actually resides in the root folder of your website so it's like uh, the general form is website name dot com or something slash sitemap.xml so uh, this contains a list of web pages and their change frequencies pretty cool okay and uh, another thing is robots.txt now I'm talking about crawlers as bots so you can actually web administrators create a file called uh, robots.txt now this file contains uh, some code to disallow uh, some web bots so suppose I have private content on my website that I do not want everyone to see okay I do not want it to be automatically copied by the web bots so what I can do is create a robots.txt file write in it user agent star that means all web bots and I disallow this I disallow WP admin so this is my website slash WP admin the navigation to this is not allowed by a bot so um, and also I disallow WP includes what this means is the web bots won't copy content of these web the web page in those in this folder so I can save my private information and then include that folder in my robots.txt and be sure that that information be safe uh, and won't be visited by web bots so these two things sitemap.xml and robots.txt uh, pretty handy when handling uh, bots useful for web admin especially okay coming back sorry so we have discussed cookies we have discussed web bots alright coming to search engines now you can see a lot of search engines that I've put up on this slide Google Yahoo Aldo Vista MSN a lot of them t available today okay uh, so what is a search engine it's basically to search information on the World Wide Web and um, they display SERPs that is search engine results pages so the first search engine this is just a fact that I've put for your reference uh, it's good to know so the first search engine was named Archie that is archive without a V um, uh, quite intuitive okay and they maintain real-time information by running an algorithm on the web crawler as I explained before they're running a multi-threaded 
uh, downloader and using the policy this policy actually are useful in forming the algorithm that is used by the search engine to uh, you know run the crawler and get the information so they are interrelated I'll talk about interrelation in just a few moments okay so uh, it operates in the following order a search engine first runs a crawler which fetches information which indexes information for faster access and then it search for information so um, I want to demonstrate this um, with an animation so uh, I have a lot of spiders here these are bots okay and let's say this is the world wide web these pages so what I do is they visit the pages and um, they look for documents and web addresses okay so they are crawling and fetching information what happens next is you have a search engine okay and it's it, it runs these spiders or crawlers or bots whatever you can call them and they're transferring information to your indexing software that is running on your search engine so these these um, circles that are moving from the spiders to the this server is actually data that is being transferred from the web pages next uh, this indexing software transfers data systematically to a database for faster searching so it is storing information obtained by these crawlers uh, this is for faster access and also to organize data into a systematic way now uh, it may save the entire web page or just a keyword now that depends upon the implementation of your web search engine okay that is completely dependent the next is next part is searching so you go into the browser enter a keyword and hit go or search what will happen is it will query the database not the indexing software not the bots but the database of the search engine because that is organized and indexed so you like get much faster access to in relevant information so you query the database get back the results now there are your results this is what actually happens when you type something in a search engine and get back results this is what is happening on the back end of it you're not actually seeing the process but this is what happens okay this was a short nifty animation to demonstrate your functioning of search engines I hope it's clear now okay uh, I was on search engines mm. right so these three are the operation that I demonstrated crawling indexing and searching I've put up uh, some information about various search engines that are available uh, in the previous year and the previous to previous years that is 2011 and 2010 Google owned 82.8 percent of market share last year in May Yahoo was the second with 6.42 and Bing was 3.91 percent just for statistic six um, some relevant information okay uh, so how does this actually take place how does Google or any search engine uh, come to know what how famous the website is so in this case Google uses an algorithm called PageRank this was actually developed by the founder of Google Larry Page and named after him so it's called the PageRank algorithm so you see faces here okay so these faces are actually websites so uh, this is a cartoon but uh, it uh, it is enough to understand it suppose I have a lot of small websites here quite less famous this is the most famous website this is the biggest face here let's say this is the second most famous website and etc so I have less famous somewhat famous and the most famous websites so and these hands that you see from the less famous to some other website are the links so this is a web page let's say some blog it has a link to this blue website suppose blue.com so it's pointing to this website blue.com has a link to yellow.com okay denoted by this arrow now page rank says the page rank of a page is high if it is referenced by a page whose page rank is itself high what I mean is 
for example suppose uh, facebook is the most is the second most famous in the web in the website website of the world wide web okay so let's say this is facebook right so and uh, uh, some some link is posted on Facebook. Let's say some blog dot com. Okay, so let's say my blog dot com. So or your blog dot com. So I have a link on Facebook that's pointing to my blog. Now my blog or your blog will actually have a higher page rank when it is pointed to by Facebook rather than pointed to by some other blog which is less famous. So the more famous website points to your blog the more famous your website gets okay that's a fundamental law of page rank algorithm so that is why you have a lot of ads on facebook as well as google pointing to websites because they are the most famous websites the website that they reference will actually gain popularity it is the belief via belief of this page rank algorithm okay in simple terms so page rank is noted by pr of e uh, it is a numerical weighting of each element of a hyperlink set that is your link as I said so you are measuring the relative importance of websites in decreasing order for example Google is the, the most famous website then you have Facebook and then so on so the relative importance okay and Google will actually recalculate page rank every time it crawls the web and rebuild it and next so this is related to your web bots Whenever webbots fetch new information, it will recalculate page rank and then rebuild the index. So that is why whenever you search something, you get millions of results, right? But there are only some results that are in the top 10. They are the most relevant results and actually based on page ranks. So um, that's how Google does it. Okay, before I go on to questions, I will come back to the fundamental topic of today was the relation between these three things that is cookies crawlers and search engines is that cookies act like human beings you they are containing human information human beings preferences and stuff okay they are being sent to different websites crawlers are getting information from those websites and search engines are indexing those that information so it's about getting something from humans and returning it back this is actually beneficial as I demonstrated in the shopping cart example I was shown the relative books the recommended books that uh, based upon my browsing history so I am more much more inclined to buy books that interest me the most that is done via cookies okay so the shopping website will make profits if it will record my history and has and hence I will also be benefited if I get books of my interest so these three things are actually made for humans they're actually working for us so that is how they are interrelated okay so this is about cookies web bots and uh, finally web search engines so i'm open to questions if you have any you can just post it in the comment section and i would like to thank you all for attending this presentation